Words at War presents a story by and with Hendrik Willem van Loon. Here is a preface to my story. The year is 1933. The speaker is Adolf Hitler. Nazis seek to destroy not only Christianity and Judaism. We are fighting against the most ancient curse that humanity has brought upon itself. Ah, the god of the deserts, the crazed, stupid, vengeful, Asiatic despot with his powers to make laws. Honor thy father and thy mother. Every boy revolts and hates his father and must do so to start his own life. It's an immortal law of nature. Thou shalt not steal. Wrong. All life is theft. I am the Lord thy God. Who? That Asiatic tyrant? No. This is what we are fighting against. Against those Ten Commandments. This is another of the Words at War programs presented each week by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime. The prefatory scene you've just heard is described in Hermann Rauschning's preface to the Ten Commandments, a volume of ten short novels of Hitler's war against the moral code. The novels themselves were written by ten distinguished writers, and the story we present tonight, a story that will be narrated by the author himself, is Hendrik Willem van Loon's The Ninth Commandment. And this is the Ninth Commandment. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. It is coming, Samuel. It is coming, the train. I hear it, wife. Oh, Samuel, I wonder what he will be like, our little German boy. Calm yourself, wife. It is unseemly for a God-fearing woman to show excitement in public places. Yes, Samuel. As for what our little German refugee will be like, well, you may rest assured of one thing. He will be hungry. You see, I've called him Samuel, but that was not his name. And I shall call the town where he lived by the name of Neustadt, which is not its name either. But I can tell you this. It's a very ancient town, a town reaching its history back to the 12th century. A typical Dutch town where the typical Dutch people live, you know, live in either love or fear of God and of God's word. And in this respect, at least, Samuel, the picture frame maker, was very typically Dutch. He regarded the Holy Bible as the only really good book. He was industrious, he was honest, dignified, stubborn, and dull. But in the matter of morals, ah, he was distinctly narrow-minded. But Samuel also had a heart. He was always willing to lend a helping hand to those in trouble. And that's why on a day in the year 1919, he and his good wife and company with all the other new Stadtburgers stood at the little railway station to welcome a trainload of half-starved German children. Children who had been nursed on potato peels and ersatz milk and little elves, the most pitiful victims of the latest outbreak of human folly of World War I. And now, here you are, Samuel. Here is your little boy. His name is Johann. Johann? You live with Mr. and Mrs. Samuel and their children, and you will love them for their kind people. I'm afraid he doesn't understand anything I've said. You see, he doesn't speak our language. He will learn soon enough, Doctor. He looks like a bright boy. Oh, yes, he does. Come, my little one. Come home with us now. We are so happy to have you. Oh, I'll feed you platefuls of rich cream and chocolate. I'll give you soup oh, and no, meat and... Oh, no, no, Mrs. Samuel. Please, do you wish to kill your little charge? Kill him? But, Doctor, I, I do not understand. I... The doctor means, good wife, that to little children such as these, too much food is dangerous. Exactly. 
exactly. We have found that during the first weeks, at least, a breakfast consisting of even one egg and a slice of bread often causes gastric disturbances which prove fatal. Oh, I see. So do not be too generous at first, Mrs. Samuel. We shall do as you direct, Doctor. Come, wife. We will take Johan to our home. When the child, after a few days, had regained some of his strength, they sent a little boy to a Dutch school with Samuel, Jr., And twenty, twelve elevens of one hundred and thirty-two, twelve twelves of one hundred and forty-four. Why, Johan, that's marvelous. In so short a time to be able to speak our language so well. <laughs> Why, I do believe you're a little Dutch boy at heart. I'm not a Dutch boy. I'm a muffje, a little muff. Who called you a little muff? These children. They shouldn't call you by that name. And why not, teacher? It is the Dutch name for the Germans, is it not? Mm, yes, but will you see, Johan, it's not... Uh, it, it's not exactly a flattering term. That I do not care. I am proud of it. I am a little muff. They are... Huh, they are just plain Dutchmen. In his new home, Johan was not exactly spoiled with unessential tidbits, for sugar and sweets cost money, and the good Dutch Calvinists are greatly opposed to the idea of wasting hard-earned pennies upon the luxuries of life. This frugality went so far in the Samuel household that the mother and father allowed themselves only three spoonfuls of sugar each day, keeping the precious sweet in the silver sugar bowl which then in turn was locked in a strong wooden box, the key of which was placed underneath the family Bible, all of which now brings us to the next chapter of our little story. Wife? Yes, Samuel? Come here, please. Yes. Wife, look. The sugar! Yes. Oh. It isn't possible, and yet it's happened. Someone has taken the key and helped himself to the contents of the sugar bowl. But who, who could it be? It could not have been our own son or our little daughter. No. Our God-fearing children never yes. have they stolen sugar. It must be Johan. Oh, no, Samuel. He couldn't have. He wouldn't. We shall find out. Call him to me. sent for me, mein Herr? Yes, my boy. Tell me, did you steal sugar? I want you to be honest, for you are confessing not only to me, but also to your God. Yeah, mein Herr. Why? Why did you steal the sugar? Because I was hungry and wanted sugar. Why did you not ask me or your mother for it? I don't know, mein Herr. You are not afraid of us? No, mein Herr. Was it the sinful wickedness of your character that made you commit this sin? I... I did not think, mein Herr, that it was a sin. I took only a little. In the eyes of God, it did not matter whether you took much or little. It is writ in the Holy Bible, Thou shalt not steal. Fortunately, my boy, you have not sinned against the next commandment, which tells you not to bear false witness... You have not lied, but have confessed the truth. Therefore, I shall be lenient with you. But you shall not leave this house before you have copied these verses from our Bible a hundredfold. A hundredfold, mein Herr? But that will take a very long time. And this afternoon, the boys and girls are going for a picnic. May I not go with them, Herr Samuel? You have heard what I've told you. I am not only supposed to look after your physical well-being... But for the moment, at least, your immortal soul has been entrusted to my care. After that, peace and quiet returned to the Samuel household. But a month later, it became apparent once more that someone was helping himself to the contents of the sugar in the locked-up bowl. And this time, Samuel decided to act with greater circumspection than before. So he hid himself in the living room till all the household seemed to be asleep. 
And then with his own eyes, he saw Johann commit the awful crime right before his eyes. But Samuel didn't let Johann know he had been observed until the next morning. Johann, answer me truthfully. Did you once more sin against one of God's holy commandments and steal what did not belong to you? Nay, mein Herr, I did not. Johann, did you steal the sugar? Nay, mein Herr. Johann, you lie. Nay, mein Herr. I speak the truth. Johann, I saw you myself. Nay, mein Herr. Johann, sit down. Sit down while I read you another of God's holy commandments. Listen. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Do you understand that? Do you? Thou shalt not bear false witness. I did not do it. And who then may have done it? How should I know? Why don't you ask your son? He lives in this house too. Johann, it stands writ. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. I caught you in the act. I saw you steal the sugar. And now you bear false witness against your own foster brother. God would never forgive me if I spared you now. Come here to me. I, no, I, oh, 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 stop. Oh, stop. Now get away from me, you sinful boy. I, oh, Samuel, Samuel. Oh, the poor little boy. How could you be such a brute? Look what has happened. He's hit his head against the door frame where he fell. It is what he deserved. Oh, the boy did wrong. But that was no reason to kill him as I think you have done. In that case, he will go forth to meet his lord with a clear conscience. <sighs> a bit of water will bring him to soon enough. After that, he can go to school. But little Johann didn't go to school that day. No, instead, he mussed up his clothes. He dirtied his chubby face. He tore his collar open. He combed his hair in such a way that the bump on his head showed clearly. And then he took himself to the town hall, where he searched until he found the burgomaster's office. When he was assured that he was outside the right door, he burst out crying so pitifully it would have broken the hardest heart. The burgomaster, in great alarm, sent at once for the chief of police, and between them, they tried to soothe the battered youngster. Oh, there, there, my boy. You mustn't cry like that. Herr burgomaster. Yes? Do you not recognize the little fellow? It is the little nut who has been staying at the Samuels, Your Honor. Oh, good heavens, it is. He looks as though he'd been beaten within an inch of his life. This is terrible, chief, terrible. This may have the makings of an international incident. <laughs> that is true. All foster parents were warned that under no circumstances were they to use corporal punishment upon these little German refugees. Oh, what are we to do? Oh, there, there, little boy. Here, here is a quarter for you. Thank you, mein Herr. Oh. oh, do not cry so. Tell me what happened to you. It is my foster father, Herr Samuel. He treats me badly. He will not give me enough to eat. Oh, now, my boy, that can hardly be true. To me, you look well taken care of. But he beat me. He beat me. He said I stole his sugar and I didn't. But he beat me. <laughs> Nobody was awful. I want to go back to Germany. Nobody loves me. Now, now, you must stop crying this minute. There, that's better. Now listen to me, my boy. I promise you that it will never happen again during your stay at Neustadt. So let's forget all about it, shall we? Yes, Your Honor. Whatever you say, Your Honor. Ah, that's the idea. Here, here's another quarter to buy yourself chocolate. Oh, now, thank you, my dear. Now you run home and be a good boy and do not mention this to anybody. Not to anybody. Promise? Yeah, Your Honor. I thank Your Honor for his kindness, and I promise Your Honor that I will never mention this to anyone, ever. Give me 50 cents worth of caramels, the big ones, and lots of chocolate. The burgomaster just now gave me two quarters to make me forget about the terrible beating my Herr Samuel gave me. Oh, my goodness. See, there is where he struck me on the head, and all over my body I am black and blue, and I am so lame I can hardly walk. Oh, my. Oh, it's a terrible thing. Have you 
Did you hear? Herr Samuel. He beat the little muff within an inch of his life. Well, it seems the boy was beaten for refusing to take part in some religious hocus-pocus that Samuel goes in for. It's old Samuel's religious bigotry. That's what it is. I hear he's injured the boy's spine. He'll be a bedridden invalid for life. That despotic old man. Somebody ought to do something about it. Yes, it became a very famous case. There were pictures in the town paper, resolutions in the town council, and old Samuel, poor old Samuel, was partially ostracized. But he, in his quiet way, pretended not to notice. Then all was quiet again, and on the appointed day, Johann, along with all the other little refugees, he climbed aboard a train. They all went back to Germany, fat little versions of the starving children who had arrived in Neustadt a month before. But all the Samuel family heard from their little Johann was a postcard they received when he returned home. A card that carried his brief message. I am so grateful that you can be sure I shall never forget anything. Your loving Johann. Well, the years passed by. Old Samuel's wife died. The old man was quite alone. He tended to what little business remained to him, and he read his Bible between times. And then one day, the door of his shop opened, and in came a blonde young giant. The young giant walked to old Samuel and threw both his arms around him. Lieber Papa! Lieber Papa! Yeah? My Boy, yeah. my boy, it is good to see you. And looking so fine and prosperous, too. Yeah. No longer will we be able to call you our little Johan. But I still am your little Johan. Nothing has changed, lieber Papa. I love you just as much as ever. <laughs> and uh, what brings you here so unexpectedly, business? Not at all. I have a splendid job. In our wonderful new Germany, we all have jobs. But I have worked so hard that my employer insisted on my taking a short furlough. Uh, I, I mean, a little holiday. And I thought, why not do now what I've always wanted to do? Visit my dear old home in Neustadt, where I was so happy as a child. That thought, my boy, does you credit. And I hope you will stay with us. Uh, tell me, where is my little sister? Oh, she's married and lives in Breskens, just uh, across the Skelt. Oh, and uh, my brother? He's with the army doing his year's service. Hmm. That's interesting. Where is he stationed? In Bergen up Zorn. You remember the town where the uh, railroad leaves the mainland? Mm -hmm. How wonderful. Uh, then I can visit him. Oh, no, no, it's not necessary. Your honey comes home every Sunday. Oh, but th that's not enough. I loved him dearly. I must go to Bergen up soon and look him up. Uh, that uh, might not be so easy, Johann. You see, they've uh, been rather strict with foreigners since there's been all this talk of oh, war. Oh, but you forget mine, lieber Vater. I am not really a foreigner. At heart, I am still your own little Dutch boy. I speak the language fluently, so much so that in the train everybody took me for a Dutchman. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> and now, lieber Papa... Do you want me to really enjoy my fir my holiday? Well, of course, my boy, of course. What can I do for you? Well, I want you to go up and pay several visits to my foster brother. At least I'd like to go at the army camp. And I want to take some pictures of the dear old countryside, which I remember so fondly. Mm -hmm. So I shall... Uh, well, I'll need a bicycle and a good camera. And then I should like to use your basement as a dark room. To develop my snapshots. Of course, my boy, of course. Ah, my lieber father, you are wonderful. Yes, I shall have such a worthwhile vacation, and I shall be more indebted to you than you will ever know. Well, I'm sure you can guess at the rest, but even so, we'll continue a little longer. Eight days later, a strange Dutchman appeared at Samuel's picture frame shop. Ah, that is unfortunate. He left suddenly last night. He didn't even have time to say goodbye to me. But he 
did leave me a note thanking me for making his holiday a success. Ah, just what I was afraid of. He got away with pictures of bridges, roads, army encampments, airfields, everything. Uh, I uh, do not understand. Your foster son, Herr Samuel, is a German spy in the pay of the general staff of the German army. My dear God, protect this boy. Grant that he may see how wicked his heart is. I have tried to love him as my own son, dear Heavenly Father. I implore thee, if possible, bring him to a realization of the fate that awaits him unless he changes his ways. Amen. Poland, Warsaw, the phony war is over, Germany turns to the west, Holland is on the alert, the good queen stands firm on the ramparts of her realm, her ministers counsel the most careful neutrality, Holland is worried, Holland is very worried. Maker Samuel heard this broadcast of the Führer and he believed it. He went upstairs and humbly thanked his God for the fact that his son was still safe, his soldier's son. He didn't know that at that very moment Samuel Jr. was lying dead with a bullet through his heart. The last of a half a dozen men who had died trying to defend the dike that led from the mainland to Zeeland. He didn't know that his son and his mates had been shot in the back by a company of German soldiers dressed in Dutch uniforms. The German soldiers who knew the Dutch language well because years before they had been children of charity who were saved from the grave by the big hearted fathers and mothers of these very men they now murdered. Hello, Leap of Papa. Johan, my dear foster son, and a sergeant too, my son. How dare you? You are speaking to your conqueror, you Dutch swine. Hmm? You don't expect me to forget the time you nearly beat me to death, do you? You are under arrest, you old psalm-singing Dutchman. You dared to try to murder an innocent German child, did you? <laughs> well, now you'll answer to German justice. But Samuel was to learn that even German justice can sometimes be tempered though never with mercy. You sent for me, my dear? Yes. Uh, sit down, Samuel. Be at your ease. Sit down, my dear? Yes, yes, sit down. I'm going to surprise you more than that, Samuel. I'm going to tell you this. You are going to be a free man. <laughs> I see that staggers you. And well, it might... The charge against you is very serious. German children are sacred and must be protected, now as in the past and in the future. Especially when those children have grown into loyal party members. As I have set forth in my deposition, my dear, I thrashed little Johann for lying to me. Yes, 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 I know. I read all the evidence, and I've come to the conclusion that he deserved it. But you must remember this. Sergeant Johann sits well with the party high command. So much so that he's been spying on me, his superior officer. 
That is why I've had him transferred to the Polish front before I called your case. The transfer, then he is no longer here in Neustadt? No, he's not. He'll never see Holland or you again, if I have my way. So that brings me to my point. The whole affair happened many years ago. There are no witnesses today who will remember it. You are an old man, and old people are... They are apt to forget. Hmm? So suppose you pretend you've forgotten what happened, eh? But I have not forgotten, my near the captain. Now, uh, <clears throat> here I have a slip of paper, and it reads... Uh, let me read it to you. Deponent, under oath, declares that the incident of his attack on the German child entrusted to his care never took place. Now, you sign this, Samuel, and it'll be the sergeant's word against yours. Here you are. Now, here's the fountain pen. Just sign it, and you can walk out of here, free man. I'm sorry, my near the captain, but I could not do that. I punish the boy for bearing false witness. I could not now bear false witness myself, merely to save my life. What? But, but listen to reason, you old fool. You, you hopeless old idiot. Do you know what it means if you don't sign? Do you realize what our laws are? Do you realize that a foreigner who has, who has dared to lift a hand against a German child will be shot? Must be shot? Yes, my near the captain. <laughs> well, then, then sign. I cannot, my near. I cannot bear false. Witness. Not even to save your life? It stands writ. Thou shalt not bear false witness. <coughs> stands writ, stands writ. Nevertheless, but... my heir, it so stands writ. And then that is your last word? It is, my heir. God knows I did my best. I would like to shake hands with you, Samuel. Gladly, my dear. No, you hard feelings? Huh? None at all, none at all, my dear. You are merely doing your duty, and I pray that God will forgive you, as I hope he will forgive me for doing mine. Goodbye, Samuel. An hour later, old Samuel, the frame maker, was stood up against the wall of the prison yard of the city of Neustadt, and he was shot to death. at War has presented tonight Hendrik Willem van Loon's The Ninth Commandment, one of ten short novels of Hitler's war against the moral code, written by ten world-famous authors and published in a volume called The Ten Commandments. Our script was prepared by Richard Madonna, and Hendrik Willem van Loon appeared as the storyteller. Others in the cast were Raymond E. Johnson as Mr. Samuel, Elizabeth Morgan as Mrs. Samuel, Ronnie Liss played Johann as a child. Dayton Allen was Johann the young man. The music was arranged and played by William A. Meter, and the entire production was directed by Anton Leder. Next week, Words at War will present They Shall Inherit the Earth by Otto Zoff, another in this series of war book adaptations brought to you in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with the independent radio stations affiliated with the NBC network. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Mm -hmm.